Hi, and welcome to the Cloud Engineering Summit. My name is Jason Smith, but you can call me Jay, and I am actually an app modernization specialist at Google Cloud. Today we're going to be talking about standing up a serverless platform, and we're going to be using Pulumi, Kubernetes, Knative, a few other little tools. Now, I want to start by talking a little bit about Kubernetes, and I think everybody who works in the cloud today knows what it is, so we'll try to make this quick. Kubernetes is kind of the de facto platform for running containers. Don't believe me? Look at all these people. This is an exact number. Might be a little dated, but of the large Kubernetes ecosystem. And this is actually just a really small one. Uh, CNCF actually released a new chart that is way larger than this. But for the sake of saving your eyes from a lot of color, we're going to do the smaller one. But trust me, this is larger. And of course it makes sense that a lot of people want to use it because it abstracts away infrastructure. If we are trying to move to the cloud, it only makes sense that we try to make the infrastructure as easy as possible. We want to make sure it is easy for us to provision nodes, provision networks, provision all of that stuff that we need. In the old days, you had to have SSH access, Sebastian server, script after script after script. I was in the data center world years ago and we relied heavily on Perl scripts. And I'm sure I just gave a few people uh, some horror flashbacks when I mentioned Perl scripts, but you know, with Kubernetes makes it so much easier. Why? Well, Kubernetes provides us with a declarative API that allows us to observe, compare, and act. It allows us to see what's happening, compare what we want it, you know, what we expect to happen, act on it, and reiterate and reiterate and re reiterate. And of course, that API is extensible. We can write custom API types. We aren't stuck to a specific platform or a specific uh, set of rules or anything. We are allowed to extend beyond that. If you've ever seen that ecosystem earlier that we talked about, a lot of those people are people who have created custom resource definitions to extend what Kubernetes is capable of doing and offer you services that you never thought of before. It's so easy. Anybody can do it. But there's always a catch. Kubernetes really isn't for developers, at least not out of the box. It's not the right abstraction for the end developer experience. They, it's great if you want to build a platform. It makes it so much easier to build a platform. But it's not for building apps. If you don't believe me, let's take a look at this. So anybody here who's used Kubernetes will be able to tell you that if you want to deploy an application, these are all the steps you have to take. And these are just the basic steps. There are additional steps there as well. You know, exposing the internet can also in include setting up Istio, standing up Ambassador, Nginx, all of that fun stuff. What do developers actually care about? Writing code, that's their job. They just wanna write code. That's what they're best at. Why not let them focus on what they're best at? This brings us to serverless. You might have already been thinking that when I mentioned making things easier for developers, you might be saying, well, haven't we heard of this before? Isn't this called serverless technology? And I'd say, you are absolutely right. Now let's talk a little bit about serverless. Why is serverless so popular? Well, we see two models within the serverless realm, as you can see here. So from a programming standpoint, when we're talking about our developers, they love the idea that they're able to write service-based applications. Service-based usually means that they can also be decoupled and they are, can also run in a stateless, uh, stateless environment, uh, in a stateless state, so to speak. Uh, because of that, they don't have to hard code or, or imperatively code any kind of uh, setup on that. And then, of course, from an operational man, uh, model, we don't want to have to handle a lot of ops to scale up as our application becomes popular, as our customer base grows. But we also want to know that everything is being taken care of. We want to tell somebody else, hey, you manage the security. You make sure nobody hacks into the servers. You make sure the servers are up. Oh, and on top of that, I only want to pay for my usage. I don't want to actually have to pay for idle workers. I mean, that, that, that makes perfect sense. You know, in the... 
that's kind of why a lot of people moved to the cloud. In the back in the day, if you wanted to have side resources just in case of a spike on, say, Black Friday or something, you would have to have servers on standby. But what happens if it's an off period? You know, those things are just gathering dust. Maybe you can find some use for it. So the serverless philosophy is efficient developers and efficient operators. One way to think of it is we want to give people the ability to focus on what they are good at. We don't want developers to have to be operators. We don't necessarily want operators to have to be developers. Now, granted, we're seeing a lot more operators function in developers. And of course, we see a lot of developers function in operators. You know, that's kind of where the whole full stack developer, DevOps, that whole idea came from. But realistically, if we can have people focus on what matters to them and what they are best at, that's how we bring the best value to our projects. So while we're talking about developers, what do they care about? Velocity and re reproducibility. They do not care a thing about the infrastructure. At the end of the day, they just wanna know that their app works, their app scales, their app does what it's supposed to do. That's it. If there is a load balancer issue, they don't wanna they don't really care about it, at least in terms of their persona. Now, if somebody gives them that duty, then they care about it, but now that's taken away from their other work. So I've created kind of a serverless platform. Now, usually, or a serverless paradigm, if you will, usually it's build, deploy, and consume, but thanks to my friends at Pulumi, I've actually learned that there are four steps. Stage, build, deploy, and consume. So staging with Pulumi. Now, I'm sure you've heard a lot of talks about Pulumi. You're joining this conference, so you've probably heard a little bit about it, but let's just take a little time back and talk about what we have here. So infrastructure management is now, is now orchestrated by definition files, not hardware tooling. So this brings us to infrastructure as code. I'm sure you've all heard every tool that exists out there, uh, whether it be Terraform, CloudFormation, Chef, Puppet, the list goes on and on and on and on. And it's great because when the cloud became a thing, it made it so much easier just to deploy my application while also standing up the environment with just code rather than physically putting servers somewhere, running some startup script. That's you know, we all used to do that back in the day. Infrastructure of code does not necessarily come without its own burden, though. We often see custom language types, so we, you know, whether it be called uh, uh, the different types of DSL, HSL, HCL languages, a lot of them are t tend to be bespoke, so they will be very, very unique to a specific tool set or a specific platform and you're finding yourself having to work around that and maybe that maybe it doesn't work as well on all platforms so you're using one tool for one one tool for another you're trying to find new ways you have to manage state files so the state files tend to be saved in a directory or in the cloud somewhere to let you know where you're uh, application where your infrastructure what it looks like after the last push configuration management becomes difficult where do we save all of our files where do we save all of our, our recipes our definitions etc this all becomes very difficult and also all of this tends to exist outside of our base code so we have like this entire different box just to stand up our application then we can deploy code and, you know, for the most part, it did make things easier and we just kind of worked around it. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case anymore because, you know, with Pulumi, I find that I don't have to write YAML cookbooks. I don't have to write JSON uh, cookbooks or definition files. I don't have to use any kind of DSL for that matter. I can use the code that I use to write my regular application to deploy a uh, serverless application on Kubernetes. Now you might be saying, well, Kubernetes, that's not exactly serverless. Bear with me and we'll talk about it a little longer. But from a developer standpoint, I can stand up code using, or I can stand up my infrastructure using nothing but 
code, regular code, in my regular coding cycle, in my regular CI CD pipeline, I can actually create a definition file in TypeScript, in Python, in Go, less copy and paste, more productivity. It's just in my normal workflow. So as a developer who writes in Python or Ruby or whatever your language of choice is, this fits right into my normal workload. This doesn't feel like additional work, so to speak, because I can write it into my normal loop or my normal workflow, as I mentioned earlier, and it can be put into CI CD pipelines as part of that building status. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about CI CD pipelines. So we're going to jump into the build portion of the serverless. Many of you may have heard of Tecton, you may not have. It is an open source tool governed by the CD Foundation. If you're not familiar with the CD Foundation, it is something of a spinoff of the CNCF Foundation. What they're trying to solve is a way to make cloud native declarative uh, CI CD pipelines. So Tecton uses Kubernetes native components. What does that mean? Well, it means that everything is, is a Kubernetes API extendable. Everything is extended from the Kubernetes API. Everything's a Kubernetes object. Every step is a Kubernetes container or it runs on a pod. So everything is Kubernetes. It can actually live in your cluster, which a lot of people actually like because if you're running a large cluster, say on prem, and you don't want your you don't want to have to ping to the outside world in order to trigger your pipeline or whatever, this is perfect. We also offer catalogs or Tecton offers catalogs. So for a lot of the tooling that you'd use that is pretty common, so like pulling from GitHub or pushing to GitLab or, or standing up a Google Kubernetes cluster or a uh, Kind cluster or whatever that might be, very common actions. We can create a catalog that has reusable tasks and pipelines that you can just download, plug in the specifics of your information or of your environment and run. And then it also integrates with other products that exist out there, such as Jenkins X, uh, integrates with Knative, which we'll talk about shortly, and even more. And as more people join the CD Foundation, we're starting to see more and more companies adopt Tecton. And really, I think it's going to become the gold standard of cloud native pipelines. And this kind of gives you a quick overview of what a pipeline is. Uh, so you, you've probably seen something like this before. So you can create a trigger in Tecton that whenever you push something to a specific branch or with a specific tag in your Git repository, it will then trigger the pipeline. Each step, each pipeline creates, or each pipeline has a variety of steps. So each little box here can be seen as a step. You can actually create some additional logic to tell it based on this criteria, execute this step. So as you can see the branching here, as a step completes, spins up another pod for the next step and the next step until things are done. So all in the cloud, you can actually automate using code, the entire CI CD pipeline. Now, if we're taking a step back with Palomi here, or Palumi, sorry, uh, what we have is the opportunity to actually create a pipeline for code that builds clusters. That's actually pretty interesting when you think about it. Just like you would create a pipeline to create a service that does machine learning or anything like that. Now we're gonna jump into Knative. Now, what is Knative? I don't like to say it's a serverless platform or a serverless framework because it's more like the components to build a serverless framework. We don't try to define specifically what a serverless framework is as much as we want to give you the ability to fulfill that serverless paradigm that I mentioned earlier of being developer focused and not focusing so much on the infra or the deploy process of your application building. So Knative is an open source project. It was open sourced by Google back in 2018 at Google Next. Uh, it is 100% open source. We have a variety of companies involved in maintaining it, but of course Google is 100% committed to it as well. So you have kind of this 
huge mind trust in building it. It creates a set of building blocks to can create your own fasts or paths. So when I mentioned earlier, we're not trying to tell you in an opinionated way, well, serverless is functions or serverless is paths. What we are saying is serverless abstracts Kubernetes tasks from the user. How you want to stand that up is up to you. So it, it's an abstraction on top of Kubernetes. It automates a lot of the Kubernetes deployment. So if you want to if you want to move it up to the higher level to where it acts as a function as a service with say open pass, you can do that. If you want to do it lower level and make it more like a platform as a service based on containers, you can do that as well. And it runs on containers at the end of the day. I do want to emphasize it is not a Google product. It is an open source product that Google open sourced and Google contributes to. It is not a Google product. You do not have to pay a license fee in order to download it. You can go to GitHub right now, pull it down, use it and do whatever you want. And it's open source. You can contribute, you can extend it. We encourage contributing. And of course, like I said, it's not a fast. Uh, it, it's not functions. We're not talking about functions. You can build a function as a service framework on top of Knative, but it's not functions in and of itself. So what can you do? From a developer perspective, directly deploy code. It's not easy, but it works great. So I try to avoid telling people we make anything easy because easy is kind of you know objective. It depends on who you are. You know, some people think just writing on the CLI is easy, whereas other people prefer the UI. What we do is we simplify the deployment process to where developers don't have to focus as much on that tedious task. The operators love it because it puts a level of abstraction between the devs and Kubernetes. You know, if you're an operator, you have a lot of stuff to do already. You don't wanna have to, on top of that, do deployment work. You want to be able to focus on what you need to and let the developers focus on what they need to and enable them to do the deployment without hassle. Now, for your platform architects, they can define what their platform looks like because it's not super opinionated. It's not saying, yes, you have to use functions. It's saying, hey, we are abstracting Kubernetes and you can build whatever you want on top of this abstraction. Now, out of the box, I would describe it more closely as a pass, but we have seen people install other tooling on top of it to make it more fast related, uh, kind of re removing a lot of the containerization, if you will. So let's talk a little bit about what the stack looks like. So Kubernetes is the platform, and that will, will build out later. The primitives that we offer are serving events and, well, I put build on there and it's a funny story. So build was originally one part of the K native components, but it became such a way that we, it, that the developers thought, Hey, this is such a great product. It shouldn't be strictly for K native. It should be for anything cloud native CICD. So build spun out became Tekton. And since about version 0.8, it's been deprecated from the K native stack. I usually like to reference it just in case somebody's diving into old documentation. Again, this is a 2018 summer product. So there's a, most documentation is relatively recent. Uh, so, you know, kind of given that context. And on top of that, as you can see, you can install a bunch of different products. So Google, we actually have Cloud Run, which is a managed version of Knative serving. But you can see there are a lot of other tools that are built on top of these Knative primitives. Let's talk a little bit about the components. So Knative serving, what makes this easier? Well, Knative serving is what actually handles the deployments. When you deploy a new version, it automates that revision handling, it automates the traffic splitting, and it automates the auto scaling. What does that mean? Well, it means it's seamless to scale up and down. It is seamless to build in, uh, to do the traffic re between revisions if you want to do like canary test, AB, whatever. Uh, it integrates directly with a service mesh. So out of the, I wouldn't say out of the box, but originally it supported just Distio, but now it's supporting Contour and Glue and Ambassador and a few others, depending on what your needs are. And it's easy to reason about it. And again, it is extensible because it's built on top of Kubernetes, Kubernetes objects. So if you want to use your own autoscaler, if you want to use your own monitoring platform, you're absolutely allowed to do it. You're not boxed in. 
And here's a quick look at what it might do. So, you know, where you see service my function here, that's what I've deployed. That's the application I've deployed in a container. The, the configuration will then handle the revision, so the different versions. So I push a version. A day later, I push another version. It will then deploy the next one. And then the route is what routes the traffic. So a quick look here is that Kubernetes does memory and CPU based scaling. So if we just talk about straight Kubernetes without Knative, Knative does it based on requests. Scale to zero, Kubernetes can't do it. Knative, your applications absolutely can scale to zero. And there is a way to set like one pod if you want to have warm uh, startups instead of cold. Uh, but it will scale to zero because the Knative operator, the Knative components, the, the Knative serving components, that is what's actually listening to traffic coming from the uh, coming from outside world, inside world. And it is when it gets the traffic, it wakes up the, the application saying, hey, we need to run this application X amount of pods and route the traffic there. So you're able to scale down to zero if there's no traffic. The load, ba the load balancer, much easier to set up. It's based on requests and you can do simple traffic splitting. And let's actually take a look at what Kubernetes looks like or with Knative. So anybody who's deployed a Kubernetes app has seen something like this. This is a simple hello world app, but look at all that text. Is there any way to make this easier? And by the way, this is two files or you can just stack them in one. But with Knative, I don't really need to set replicas because serving already does that for me. I don't really need to set these labels either because I don't really need all this. Like I only need these lines the name and I need to call it a service. Uh, I need to know what container I'm using, maybe set some limits. A lot of these lines aren't really necessary. So instead I can write this simple service, Knative service using the Knative API. And as you can see that, ex that exact file, I can deploy that exact application with just these lines here. Same exact thing. Cloud Run for Anthos, I want to mention, is a Google's uh, managed Knative offering for Kubernetes. We also, it is a Kubernetes offering. We have a fully managed version as well. Uh, so we have one that's Knative serving API compliant, but it's running on top of different things. So if you don't care about Kubernetes, if you just want pure serverless, Cloud Run fully manages for you. If you want to extend it, and you want more freedom, Cloud Native or Cloud Run on Anthos is for you because it runs in a regular Kubernetes offering. Now, let's talk about eventing. What is eventing? Now, I would encourage you to go to serverlesseventing.com because I write a lot about it, but we'll touch upon it here a little bit. Anybody who's had to write an application that connected to code or connected uh, to a Kafka bus or some kind of message queue out there knows that you have to imperatively debind, debind your code to that. Well, that doesn't make much sense in the world of microservices because the whole idea of microservices is that they're a bunch of decoupled service. We don't want to have to declaratively bind them to anything specific or imperatively bind them. What if we could declaratively bind them? Knative eventing kind of creates that abstraction between your application and whatever your messaging queue is to where instead of writing an application that connects directly to the queue, you just write an application that either handles egress or ingress. Knative eventing will then handle that traffic and tell it where to route, what, tra what uh, topic it's supposed to subscribe to, how to authenticate with secure TLS and mutual TLS. You can create your own pipelines. You can do view events, live streams, and it connects to your existing system. So we're not saying you have to throw away everything you have today to use Knative eventing. You can use whatever it is you use today. Kafka, we support a lot of things. Kafka, Nats, PubSub, uh, I, the list goes on and on. If you go to knative.dev, you can see it all. So this kind of gives you a quick idea of what Knative eventing looks like. Uh, obviously it can change because it is an open source and kind of pre I don't want to, yeah, it's pre, I guess, enterprise release, if you will. So we have the two basic uh, paradigms here when it comes to delivery. We have simple delivery. Something hits a source, let's say our, our Kafka topic, and we just want it to go straight to the service. 
Like, not simple as that. You can set up a simple delivery for that. All that service has to do is be able to read a uh, post request and it's good to go. So it doesn't have to directly connect to anything. Now, maybe you have a more advanced topic and you want to give a little intelligence to it. You're actually able to create a channel which operates under the subscription model. So you create various subscriptions to the channel and based on the traffic that comes in or other parameters, it can route that message to a different service or a different channel, as you can see. So you can do some really advanced routing too, which is great when you're scaling out and building larger apps. Why don't we jump into a demo and I'll show you how we can do this. So let's take a look at the demo. So I'm not going to belabor this part because I'm sure you've seen plenty of Pulumi demos uh, today, but I did want to point out some of the basics here. So we have some TypeScript and what it's going to do is it's going to provision a Kubernetes cluster for us. Uh, then, But we also have a few other features here. So we're going to pull down Knative. Uh, what we have here is we have our Istio CRDs. So Istio is a requirement for Knative. Uh, or it, it was an original requirement, I should say. So we do support, or Knative does support other versions such as Ambassador, Glue, a variety of other types of service meshes, ingress controllers, etc. Uh, for the sake of this, we're going to use Istio since that was kind of the original. So we're going to install that. We're going to install some required Istio components for Knative. Then we're going to go ahead and install the Knative eventing and the K native serving components. Now, the beautiful thing is lately, Knative team has actually created an operator so you don't have to install the components individually and their CRDs individually. You can just kind of install it as one thing. So we're gonna actually install that operator. Back in the day, you had to install it separately. And honestly, sometimes I still do that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm starting to get used to using the operator since it's new and easier to use. Uh, some basic, uh, we also have some streaming, so we're going to be installing a Strimzy operator. If you're not familiar, Strimzy is an open source uh, solution based on CNCF. It's essentially a way to run Kafka easily on a Kubernetes cluster, making it easier to do it without having to do a lot of Zookeeper and whatnot provisions. Uh, so we set some utils as well for role binding, all that good stuff. We have this Tecton thing. Now, we're not going to show the Tecton today, but we do have the code. I do encourage people to go and play with it and figure out how the best way to get through that and run that. We also have a sample application. So this is going to be the interesting part. So we have a simple application uh, that pulls code from AlphaVantage. Uh, not code, but uh, you, it pings the AlphaVantage API. I really like using the AlphaVantage API because one, it's free and two, or up to, I think, 500 requests a day. But also, if you are a uh, person building streaming software and you want to build a demo, I can't really think of a better example of streaming data than financial data since that seems to change every second almost every microsecond really uh, so yeah so we pull there some currency information we're going to just do some exchange rate of Japanese yen to US dollar so that's that part we also have a producer so this is what's actually going to act as our event source the producer is going to send the data to the Kafka cluster so basically, our event source egresses to the, the Kafka producer, which then writes to Kafka. Now you might be asking yourself, well, you know, in this code, it doesn't actually say to connect to a specific service. Well, what I have up here is a URL called ksync, or a, a, a variable called ksync, and ksync is essentially saying event sync. Now, how does it know what the event sync is? That's a very good question. What we do here is we look at sync binding, and a sync binding is a Kubernetes object that tells Knative eventing, hey, things coming from this subject, so this is gonna be our source, things coming from currency source should go to Kafka pro, uh, producer. So you know when I mentioned earlier, you just worry about egress, ingress? That's exactly what we're doing right here. This is just sending a post request to whatever our sync URL is, ksync. And then this, just simply getting any post requests coming in. Simple as that. 
We also have some, uh, so talking about Strimzy, this is how easy it is to deploy a cluster on Strimzy once you have the operator installed. Uh, this is also how we create, this uh, service is called a Kafka consumer. So if we have something writing to a topic, we need something to consume said topic. So this is what's going to consume the topic. And you can see in the same idea, it's uh, using a sync. So it's sending to an event viewer. We have an event viewer, YAML. If you actually want to see the code, we have the code right here. It simply just displays whatever comes to it through that post. Uh, and also want to point out one more thing. So we just create a topic on our cluster called finance. Simple enough. All right, so let's see what we got here. All right, so I actually had these running a while ago, but let me go ahead and delete them so you can see it fresh. So we're gonna delete Kafka producer. I just create use because as you can see, and what you'll see in the readme is that you're able to replace it with your project ID. So when pushing up the code, I just created a separate file called use and get ignored it. So in case you're curious, no, not data. We're going to just delete these files really easily. All right, simple as that. So let's go ahead and send the producer first. Basically, with the way sync binding works is the sync has to be set up before the source is set up. So essentially, there has to be something catching the data before you send you create the thing that's sending the data. So let's go ahead and do that. So our source is called currency source. Containers creating. So I wrote some code in to the currency source that's also going to output stuff. So that way we can see, okay, well, this is the uh, currency that's coming out. So let's do it this way. All right. And let's take a look here. Or I'm sorry, it's actually in producer. All right. If we see nothing in currency source, that means that it's working. All right. So here is our currency exchange rate. Now, ideally, what we're going to do is we are going to set up our event viewer. Now, this is just a simple kind of proof of concept, if you will. Uh, you know, if this was a real app, it might very well be something that is, you know, uh, you know uh, displaying like a, a front end or something to that effect. Maybe you have a machine learning pod that is running uh, data or, you know, running some kind of process against the data that's coming in. There's various things that we can do here. Let's see, uh, and then we do user container. Oh, well, look at that. In real time, too. Because if we go back here to producer, we should probably see a new one, 715. All right. Yeah, so it's pretty pretty neat. So it takes it's going to take a second because I have a low-level container. But as we can come up here into GKE in Google Cloud Console, so... If you look through my example, and uh, we'll we'll put it in the in the notes where you can get my GitHub and you can test around with this and whatnot. We have a, a secret Alpha Vantage key that does API call. We're able to pull that code. We're able to run that. We're able to pretty much do everything that we need to do. And in real time, we're able to stream some uh, financial application. Now, why is this important? If you actually look at what we have here, we have we have stood up these clusters right here using nothing but code. And as you can see, this is just standard TypeScript. This isn't a special uh, type of language that we need to use to create a, uh, create a definition. This is standard code I can put into my standard pipeline. And on top of that, we have more code. 
And with this more code, we are able to actually write the application. All I needed to do to deploy it was create a simple Docker file. And then as you could see, all I did was using these YAML files, was able to push the application. As you can see, very simple YAML file. All I have to do is give it a name, kind of declare with a kind, and then also say where the image is hosted. Simple enough. Once that happens, you know, we have the eventing portion. Uh, as you can see here, I did, as the developer, now this might be a little bit of a different example, but uh, from the consumer per, 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 uh, excuse me, from the consumer perspective, but as an event source, there's very little actual connecting to anything here. So my event viewer is just egress, or is just ingressing the information as we can see here rather than connecting to anything specific. It is actually Knative and the Knative operators, uh, Knative components that are connecting, the Knative eventing. So from a developer perspective, I am able to, from the ground up, build the entire application as code, as true code, not a third party thing that is hard to maintain, uh, some special language, it is all, simple code that I use every single day, I was able to literally be a full stack developer. I built the infrastructure, I built my code, I deployed it, I didn't have to do a lot of configuration, and it's all running on top of Kubernetes. At the end of the day, this is, as you can see here, this is a Kubernetes cluster at the end of the day. So this is all very, very just, I would say, the future of development of cloud native full stack development. And it's all thanks to Pulumi and Knative and Kubernetes. So it wasn't that easy. I was able to stage my environment, build my code, deploy it and use it all with a code layer. I didn't actually have to do much at all from an infrastructure par portion. I was able to just use the languages I use on the daily. So. That was standing up a serverless platform. I really hope you enjoy it. I encourage you to tweet me. I am usually pretty responsive on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, please message me. You can also check out my LinkedIn. Please also check out serverlesseventing.com and also check out what Google Cloud has to offer. And we, uh, we work with Pulumi all the time. So I recommend giving us all a talk. Thank you and have a great day.